That way we can just be like, oh, it's too late because it's tech time. You know, that's just, why people say it's tech time. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we All right. Well, about to start. So, hello, everyone. I'm Evan. And I'm Adeline, and we're part of a student organization on campus, Young Americans for Freedom. And we hold meetings every Monday night at 7 p.m. in Fisher 329, and we're open to all views. And today we are fortunate enough to have Gabby Hoffman here. She's a, a media strategist and a freelance journalist, and she's host of the podcast District of Conservation. And she's here to talk um, to us about 
environmentalism, energy, and conservation. And just without further ado, Gabby Hoffman. Wow, good crowd. I'm really flattered that a lot of you from within campus and outside of campus joined. Really delighted to be here. I love coming to states where you guys love to hunt and fish, since I like to hunt and fish as well. So I'm among friends and allies, so it's good to be here. I'm going to present to you guys about a subject that has been kind of catching on fire among students, and students have requested me to come to different campuses. It's really cool to stop in Michigan to talk about this, but about how you can advance environmentalism or conservation from a politically conservative perspective. And it's kind of inherent in our nature, if you're of the center-right mind, to be conservative, but I figured I could marry the two ideas together, talk about things that are already common sense, and make a really interactive and informative presentation. So I hope you like what I have to offer. So let's begin with the slides. I won't bore you with my biography, but I think I'm a little bit qualified to talk about conservation, even though I don't have a biology degree. Um, <laughs> I know, that's a, credentials are a big thing these days. But as a journalist, I've been studying, and tell me if I am too soft or too low. Okay, I'm good. Awesome. I'm trying to figure out where I should stand so you guys can see things, actually, so we can see the presentation a little more. All right, so I guess I can stand here, but I can move around. But anyway, a little bit of my biography. As a freelancer, I work with a lot of different organizations, primarily nonprofits, in the conservation outdoor space, a lot of my clients also happen to be politically conservative, so it's kind of nice to have an overlap between the both of them. I host a podcast, as they explained, where I talk about these issues on the regular, and I'm one of the few who focuses exclusively on policy. I talk about really boring, really bad policy and good policy, and I also bring on storytellers who don't often go on the major podcasts, who I think have a really compelling story to share, whether they're new, whether they're women in the outdoors, young people, urban dwellers, anyone you can think of. And we match it, the politics with the non-politics. So I don't always talk about politics, but politics is a big part of it. I write regularly for townhall.com. I don't know how many of you read townhall.com, but it's a great publication. I've been, well, I've been writing for them for many years. I came back to them on a full-time basis as a freelance contributor. And let me actually adjust this. Sorry, I'm moving around. There we go. That's much better. I also am an award-winning outdoor writer. I wrote an article a few years ago about grizzly bear recovery and conservation efforts, which include hunting as a management tool. And I spoke to several experts and the judges of this organization that tested it and judged it, found it to be compelling enough where they thought as a first year member, I was deserving enough of an award, which was a really high honor to do that, and that was a few years ago, and so I was able to win an award for original reporting on a sensitive topic like that, and I love to delve into the complicated subjects. I know wolves are a big issue here, so if you guys have questions about wolves and wolf management, we can talk about that later. I'm also, in addition to my full-time work, I do several fellowships where I talk at length about environmentalism, conservation, hunting as a management tool, wildlife conservation, and everything kind of in between, so I'm able to be in the really good position to do that uh, through fellowships. And then I also personally do these activities too, as I alluded to early on in my presentation. I've been fishing since I was little. I just got into fly fishing about four or five years ago. I've been a gun owner for, I think like over half a decade now, I've lost count. And I'm relatively new to hunting. I've been hunting, I guess, more seriously four or five years, five seasons. Um, I think the biggest thing I've harvested is a white-tailed doe. I know I have much to to learn and, and grow from there, but it's a good start for me. But fully plugged into it, so I can really empathize with hunters and anglers because I actually participate in the sports as well. This slide. What I'm going to explain, so I'm going to, again, make the connection between political conservatism and conservation. And when I'm using conservation, think of it as a nicer term for environmentalism because environmentalism has become this kind of soiled, dirty term, which is conflated with top-down government solutions when we know that to better the environment, you don't really need to have invasive policies. You can use private individuals, public-private partnerships, things of that sort. So think of environmentalism as conservation, which it should be. And I think people respond to that term a lot better. And that's why I like to use it for these presentations, because people like the term better. It's a lot more cohesive. 
I'm going to talk about what the political left often gets wrong about conservation, what environmentalism looks like under the current administration, and how conservatives can win the argument on these issues. I think it's perfectly acceptable to make a connection between, again, the philosophy of political conservatism and conservation. I think they can coexist perfectly well. I try to live that in my own lifestyle. I know plenty of you probably do, and probably plenty of you watching from home do as well. But there's a coexistence between the two, and I'm going to explain why throughout these next few slides. I think a lot of times you probably have seen these aforementioned accusations that the left or radical environmentalists wield towards conservatives. They say that we're despoilers of the land, that we support and want dirty air and dirty water, and that we just hate the environment. I have been on the receiving end of these attacks myself for many years, and I know many more before me who are in more prominent positions than me have also been accused of all these different names and, and different uh, labels, but that isn't true. Especially, I know in Michigan, a lot of people who are center right, and th these activities are not exclusive to one party or another, but I'm gonna showcase how conservatives actually tend to incline themselves more to these activities. But these three points can be easily debunked, and I, I'm sure of it, I know it works. If we fight back and hit back at their arguments, you can certainly do that. But there are ways to counteract this and to not let these dirty characterizations, if you will, kind of delude kind of what conservatives do on this front because conservatives definitely care about the environment. We don't want to have dirty air or dirty water, especially where we recreate, especially where we hunt and fish because it would be counterintuitive. Who wants that? No one does. And unfortunately that's been a sticking point, but I think more people are starting to fight back against that argument, especially since conservatives are more empowered to fight in the culture war, things of that sort. But None of these are true, and I'm going to explain why. Next slide, please. This is an example of me with a deadhead in Pennsylvania. I did not take this home because I don't know the laws in Pennsylvania with taking deadheads or uh, sheds out of state to Virginia, so I don't want to play with it, but I had fun on a steelhead fishing trip to Lake Erie area holding that. So that's me in the field, I guess, um, finding a deadhead and relishing in that moment. But if you look at the term conserve, and conservative and conservation, while the root is not exactly spelled out between both of the words, you can kind of see the similarities between the two while they are two different distinct concepts. A conservative is someone who likes to preserve tradition. Doesn't mean you're backwards, but it means you like to uphold certain things that are timeless, much like time in the outdoors. Those are traditions handed down between families and centuries, countries, things of that sort. And conservation, kind of like conservatism, we're resourceful. We don't want to spend more than our lot. We're really frugal with our money. And same with the principle of conservation, we believe in wise use of natural resources to prevent exploitation, destruction, neglect. So again, that whole principle of wanting to conserve things that we cherish and we like, and that is also very evident in what conservatism as a philosophy is. Next slide, please. This is an elk that I photographed in Virginia's coal country. We have a burgeoning herd. We just got our first elk lottery tag season, I applied for it just to see what my luck would be there. But we have a lot of different wildlife in my state. I know you guys have plenty of wildlife. You guys have an elk herd here. And I'm going to say how conservatives are primarily stewards of the land. Doesn't matter what state you go to. I've met people in Virginia. I've met people here in Michigan when I've come to the state before. I've been to many states in my reporting work and through my lecture and spring tour that I've been embarking on. I've met plenty of people all across the country who are conservative. They love to hunt. They love to fish. They're ranchers, they're farmers, and they're landowners. And I think people are starting to come around to the idea that conservatives do these activities, that they maybe take people in these industries who also happen to be conservative for granted. And I'm going to explain why these stakeholders primarily do play a huge role in conservation. If you don't know the funding mechanisms, I'm going to explain what those are. Now, I have some empirical data pointing to conservatives tending to be the biggest conservationists. And while this data may seem a little outdated, 2012, this organization hasn't put out a new survey of this variety, to my knowledge, in my uh, past research into it. But I hope sometime this decade they do. But when this was surveyed about a decade ago, they found that hunters and anglers tend to be Republican and conservative 
by a pretty overwhelming majority. And they said that 42% of those that they spoke to indicated they were Republican, 32% said they were independent, and 18 said they were Democrat. And of those 50% that were polled, they said they were conservative, of which 22% were very conservative. These numbers may have changed because we have had a lot more people joining the hunting and fishing ranks, and that's great. And like I said, this activity is not just for one political party, even though we're trying to make the case that conservatives can partake and do lead conservation efforts in many regards. But the numbers may look a little different. Maybe there's not much of a difference, but I hope the National Wildlife Federation does put out something again like this, but this is a pretty good, I guess, snapshot into it. And there's similar uh, surveys that I have seen come out that do kind of say the same exact thing, but this was the most cohesive thing I could find because data is great. It's a good thing to cite. Uh, but I think there is a little bit of an update, hopefully one that will come out soon, but there is proof in the pudding, even through this survey, that people who are on the center right tend to recreate like this a little bit more than our counterparts on the left tend to. Although we do see a lot more people kind of in the political middle. I've noticed a lot of people that are a little center left and on the middle are starting to hunt fish more and that's great. Um, but typically it's people who espouse center right views who have been regarded as hunters and anglers for the longest time. Next slide, please. What does the left get wrong about conservation? So remember I talked about conservation kind of being a more positive term for environmentalism. I'm going to explain the two strains of environmentalism. We see one strain currently dominating politics, it, and it's kind of buoyed back and forth between these two philosophies across different administrations. And you'll see that connection about how conservation is often tweaked and misused by people who pretend to be conservationist. When you, you kind of dissect and, and digest kind of what they're trying to conflate with conservation. So next slide, please. The left loves to conflate preservation with conservation. So how many of you have heard of the term preservation when it comes to, okay, a good number of you, excellent. Now, when you pair that with conservation and you learn about the different meaning between the two, and I'll explain a little bit more in detail through the slide, it's pretty clear what one strain of environmentalism does versus the other and why the two should not be conflated with each other. So preservation, in my view, from what I've observed and what I've gathered in my reporting work and just being someone who recreates outdoors, when I hear someone claim they're conservation-minded, but they're actually pushing for different solutions that are not conservation-minded, in my mind, those individuals are preservationists. So they typically like what is happening. They want fewer people to have a seat at the table they want government top-down solutions to fix every environmental problem, even if it leads to more people paying at the pump and also paying more in electricity bills. And they often like big government policies and solutions. Now, true conservation, you can call it true conservation, conservation, they're kind of interchangeable, kind of takes a different approach. And like I said, has often been hijacked. I think true conservation is an emerging view of environmentalism, a lot more positively received. We're not doing anything different by claiming it to be conservation, but we are making the distinction now about what it means and how it applies, especially in the framework of political conservatism or maybe anti-woke politics even, if you want to even go there. It's limited government kind of thinking, free market environmentalism, even calling for more private action versus not so much government action, and it empowers individuals. That's what conservation truly does especially in this day and age when people are frustrated by government. Government can even complicate matters even more when it comes to different environmental problems. I go back to seeing the King Mine Gold spill in Colorado. I think the Flint crisis that you guys had, um, that was a government caused problem as well. And I think whenever there are those big environmental problems, government can make those situations a lot worse. And that's why I think true conservation, if that term is properly utilized, and people are empowered, they can really make a difference. And we were starting to see that between 2017 and 2021. And I'm afraid we're moving away from that, again, to this top-down kind of government environmentalism or preservationist environmentalism. Next slide, please. So Nat Geo is a great repository of information. I like certain aspects of Nat Geo. I'm very disappointed in somewhat of their direction, but they really do describe preservation and conservation I would say very succinctly. So they say preservation protects the environment from harmful human activities. 
So a lot of preservationists think our impact on the landscape is always negative. That's not always true. I think humans today are very mindful of their footprints that they leave on land, on water, everywhere, because they want to leave it better than they found it. But oftentimes, preservationists view any human impact as negative. That's typically what they do. Um, what, how you typically see it today in pop culture, political discourse, things of that sort, uh, a lot of alarmism and a lot of anti-capitalist attitudes. It's selective exploration of energy, if we're talking about energy being kind of cohesive with this. Um, you, they only want to develop certain clean energy forms. No nuclear at times, definitely no fossil fuels, and no domestic mining. We have to mine from abroad. You often see a demonization of individuals and private entities, and typically preservationism calls for, let's say, countries like the United States entering global treaties that are non-binding, that really have no impact on you know, mitigating serious pollution or combating people who are polluting or combating uh, policies that encourage polluting. So our withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accords is one thing uh, that was good. And now we're back in it and it really won't change our trajectory as a country with whether or not we're gonna be reducing emissions. We already were without being in it, but I can explain more later. The next slide, let's see that. So conservation, alternatively, protects the environment through the responsible use of natural resources. Again, according to Nat Geo. It's also another term for stewardship. You can kind of use those terms interchangeably. How I define it, and I think how most of us define it, is individuals, private interests, leading efforts, balanced use, multiple sustained yield management of public lands. How many of you have heard that term? Okay, excellent. And I also think a positive thing that people don't often understand about this is that stakeholder cooperation is very evident. I had spoken to a lot of people who heard their concerns read and understood in the last few years predating the Biden administration. Many people who live out West who have issues to deal with with grizzly bears, wolves, don't feel like their voices are being heard. They're, they feel like they're being ignored. So they're not really getting a lot of stakeholders at the table. They're kind of performative in that respect. They say, yes, we spoke to a lot of stakeholders. They really didn't take their considerations into hand. But you can often say that conservation has everyone, landowners, conservationists, industry players, states, federal government, everyone is there, not just the federal government and select environmentalists. Next slide, please. Did any of you read this article from NPR a few years ago about how the decline of hunters threatens the future of conservation? If you haven't, I will say it is great reading. I was very astonished to see this when this came out a few years ago because it finally admitted, I think, as a publication for the first time that hunters, who a lot of people in DC unfortunately revile and hate. I'm one of the few in media who doesn't, obviously, because I partake in these activities. But a lot of my colleagues in DC media typically frown upon hunting. They see it as a atrocious activity, but they realize there's a connection, monetarily speaking, between hunting and conservation funding. And I don't know how many of you know much about the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937. I will definitely explain more, but earlier this year, it was revealed not too long ago through the Fish and Wildlife Service that hunters and anglers, along with gun owners who paid excise taxes on guns and ammunition, helped generate about 1.5 billion in conservation funding. You don't often hear this mentioned in the media, but it does get talked about and it's starting to get advertised a bit more but it is primarily collected from excess taxes on guns and ammunition through the wildlife and sport fish restoration program under this law called the Pittman-Robertson Act. And there's another uh, formal title to the law, but PR funds as what we call it in the industry. But hunters and anglers do have a connection to conservation funding and you can use this as part of your arsenal in what I'm about to tell you for making that argument because many people are like, well, I go, outdoors or I bike or I hike or I scream about how much I hate polluters, I scream about this, but are they really contributing their share or to the pot of conservation? A lot of the times they're not. So it's largely hunters and anglers and other chief funders. Next slide. So the Pittman-Robertson Fund is also known as the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act of 1937. There certainly have to be some updates. I think one or two have passed in the last few years, if I'm not mistaken. I think one modernization of the act uh, will be passed soon or was passed. 
my memory is a little fogged on this because there's a lot of moving parts in conservation policy. But the Pittman Robertson Fund was passed because hunters and anglers, people who predated us many, many years ago, recognized that if they hunted species to extinction, we wouldn't have species or even fish to pursue, to admire, to harvest. And they did this at the turn of the 19th century, early 20th century, and that is why the law was passed. And I think it was probably one of the few pieces of legislation that I agree with FDR <laughs> for passing one of his very, very good hallmark pieces of legislation. And like I said, because hunters and anglers wanted to be accountable to not extirpate species from civilization and from nature, we had to put a check on ourselves. And I think this was appropriate at the time. Like I said, some modernization is going to hopefully happen, but it's a good law and it allows us to be the chief funders of conservation, even today. Next slide, please. So revenues from excise taxes are collected by the Department of Interior, if you guys didn't know that. Then they're allocated through this fund that I had mentioned, and there's also a companion one called the Sport Fish Restoration Fund. So both uh, monies that you spend towards your hunting licenses, your fishing licenses, guns and ammunition, tackle, bow archery, all of that is collected. And then ultimately, according to how much comes in through each state, it is apportioned to the 50 states based on land area and hunting and fishing licenses. So I should have put out a figure as to how much Michigan generates, but I think you guys generate a pretty solid amount, but I have to double check. But a, a lot of states get a lot of millions of dollars back, but you can check to see how much Michigan got back this year. I think upwards of the probably tens of millions, um, but it goes to help fund your, let's say stocking programs, uh, wildlife conservation efforts and habitat restoration efforts and hunters education. That's where all those monies go. And I cited this from the Tax Foundation and both the Department of Interior. Next slide, please. Okay, so I know some of you may be thinking excise taxes, taxes are terrible. And like you, I don't like paying much in taxes. I pay too much in taxes as a self-employed person. But I think an excise tax used for our activities can be executed in an excellent manner. So an excise tax is an, a tax imposed on a specific good or activity so 10% is levied on revolvers and pistols. 11% is levied on ammunition and other firearms and archery is 11%. So there's a mechanism behind how much is allocated and you can find out more on the tax foundation, but it's a pretty interesting formula how it is played there. And it doesn't hurt us so much with like imposing on your second amendment rights. Rather, it is, I think, a lot more preferable than what people want to do. We have chatter among certain conservationists and environmentalists who say, let's move away from this model and let's have bikers and hikers pay. It's our turn. And a lot of us in, in the hunting and fishing space are like, eh, that's not a good idea. We want to still be the primary funders. But even if you have some issues with excise taxes, I think this article lays out a great case for why this is probably one of the few good instances of that. Next slide, please. And then I highlighted the reason why is that because it respects the benefit principle about excise taxes so well. It enjoys general support among the public, especially those of us in the sporting and outdoor community. And the excise tax on hunting and fishing equipment can teach us some lessons about well-designed excise taxes. So this nonpartisan source, which is a very reputable source, is even saying that this can be an example for other type of taxes, but says that it's one of the best. So you don't really hear much of disapproval among sportsmen and women, only like a small minority of people. It's not a perfect model, of course, but it's something where we can feel proud of ourselves that even a little bit that we contribute can go a long way, that we know that we are funding the activities that we enjoy, the, the fish we pursue and the, and the different animals that we harvest. So it all is very cyclical. Next slide, please. So how have we advanced conservation in the public sphere, in government? We have actually established a few agencies under Republican, kind of conservative uh, presidents. I think the National Park Service, for all intents and purposes, has some issues. It has backlog problems, some corruption, things of that sort. But it was established under Theodore Roosevelt in the early 1900s. There was also the EPA, which under certain administrations can be weaponized and used against us. And I think we may see the weaponization of the EPA again under this new administration, but it was under Republicans that we created the EPA. And when we had the Trump years, we started to see a huge reduction of emissions without our membership in the Paris Accords. I think 
a lot of people were very upset about us withdrawing from that, but it really had no change on our trajectory of cutting emissions. And I think many people now realize that, especially with all of the energy upending we've had in recent weeks. There's also the Endangered Species Act, like I said, under Nixon. A lot of legislation didn't get much attention. I was maybe one of the few conservation, natural resources writers, reporters to cover a lot of the good pieces of legislation that came and passed under the Trump administration was signed into law by President Trump. There was the Modern Fish Act, which regulates recreational fishing separate from commercial fishing because for the longest time, government was regulating those two in the same way and you can't. So I thought that was really good. There was the Great American Outdoors Act. How many of you have heard about that legislation? A few of you, okay. It's, it's a good piece of legislation for the most part. It was one of the more seminal updates 50 years, one of the more consequential pieces of legislation that got pretty good bipartisan support in 2020. It's supposed to lead to a lot of improvements with uh, infrastructure and increased outdoor opportunities. There's the ACE Act. And actually in 2020, right before the Trump administration ended, there was one of the biggest expansions of hunting and fishing access on national wildlife refuges, about 2.3 million acres which is now being legally challenged by a group called the Center for Biological Diversity because they contend that allowing lead tackle and bullets is going to cause huge disruptions while it is allowed in terms of their usage while uh, hunting and fishing are allowed on those. So we're starting to see some environmentalists challenge sportsmen and women to have the ability to hunt and fish legally and safely on public lands because they don't like people using lead tackle and bullets which, debate, which is debatable in terms of their toxicity. You can talk about that. You can ask me questions about that if you prefer alternatives or let. But that's kind of problematic to me, seeing that people are trying to contest the opening of public lands through this loophole to more sporting activities, which is nonsensical. It's supposed to, we're supposed to see these expansions. But um, I'll explain more later. What does environmentalism look like? Now, I've, I've talked a lot about conservation versus preservation the different approaches, how the term is kind of um, misused by preservationists, especially those on the left. Now we're gonna see what those policies are in action. You guys know a lot of these policies, but I figured I could deconstruct them for you a bit more formally. Are we entering preservation again, a more radical form of it, going back to conservation, keeping up with it? I'm able to deduce that we are going kind of back to what we saw under the Obama administration, which is very preservationist minded for the most part, but even more to an extreme. We've been seeing a lot of rejection of oil and gas. Now we all see the high price of gas <laughs> at the pump. Uh, electricity bills are soaring. So they, this administration, this Biden administration said no one from oil and gas can work in our industry, even if they're Democrat, which is pretty bizarre. We see a lot of figures from the past. We see Gina McCarthy, who used to be EPA administrator, and John Kerry back in government, but in different positions. We also have a very historical pick in Secretary Holland, but she was an original co-sponsor of the Green New Deal, and she's also supported some anti-hunting measures. So a lot of people are very nervous about whether or not she may settle with Center for Biological Diversity, whether or not she'll uh, keep and uphold the notion of no net loss, cutting off access on public lands to sporting opportunities. And then we have, again, the energy secretary who's laughed off high gas prices and said other crazy things. And then the EPA administrator is also on board with a lot of their stuff. So we see preservation from top to bottom in different, from the upper echelons of the White House to different cabinet secretaries. They're all in sync pushing these agendas. So I'm going to explain exactly what we're seeing. Some of you some of the policies you'll recognize, some are different, maybe the first time you've seen them, but I can explain more if you're curious. Next slide. And we see actually people challenging the administration already. I know there have been some lawsuits against the banning of new oil and gas leases, uh, challenging the ending of Keystone Pipeline. I don't know if it's going to be rehabilitated. The owner decided um, to, they've been trying to recoup the funds, but. We don't see any insistence on the administration to rehabilitate Keystone Pipeline, despite all the problems we are seeing with not producing here, although we're sitting on like 38 billion barrels of crude oil and gas, uh, which is a shame we should be developing here domestically. It's safer. Um, Western states are suing the oil and gas moratorium. We also start to see schisms between uh, a lot of like stalwart, uh, 
excuse me, radical environmentalists and even some of their most diehard supporters. So something I've observed out West is a lot of people, diehard environmentalists are kind of upset with big wind for building turbines because that interferes a lot with birds of prey like condors. That's an interesting case study. If you're ever interested to see kind of the budding of heads, that's a great case study. And also we have a problem of relying on China for minerals needed for solar panels and other types of clean energy alternatives. So there's some hypocrisy. We do see some challenges, but we do see some arguments start to crack um, with respect to that. Next slide, please. So here's why the Biden administration, in my view, is pushing kind of an extreme preservationist agenda. We see them, again, putting a moratorium on new oil and gas leases, and even with us finally cutting reliance on Russia, although they may be putting us on the backs of Venezuelan oil or Saudi Arabian oil, although Saudi Arabia and UAE doesn't want us to get their oil. Um, the moratorium on oil and gas leases really did hurt us, I think. And that also implicates a conservation program called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I don't know if you guys know this, but royalties from offshore exploration of oil and gas go back to funding this critical conservation program. A lot of people on the left don't say that. We also were re-entered back into the Paris Accords. I don't think we're going to see emissions lower uh, from other participants because it was kind of a symbolic gesture like, oh, if the United States is part of this, other countries will be motivated to lower their emissions. There was no evidence of that from what I had able to gauge from the situation. But a lot of performative kind of environmentalism is what we're starting to see and a lot of destructive policies. Some more. We're not really tapping into our potential to be energy independent again. We became a net exporter of liquid natural gas under the last administration. It was called molecules of freedom. Secretary Rick Perry was mocked for using that term, but it really was kind of a liberating product that we were offering to the rest of the world. And we can certainly do that again, but we have an agency called the FERC, which says we won't be able to approve new pipelines, LNG ports and new terminals, excuse me, unless they account for how much they potentially will emit. And that is seen as an obstacle to opening new portals and a roadblock, red tape, and could be a deterrent to us achieving energy independence again. There's also a plan called 30 by 30. How many of you have heard that proposal? A few of you, okay. Um, that's something if you are a landowner and you care about access, um, it, it sounds very nice by the way that it's packaged, that it says that it's gonna preserve biodiversity, 30% of waters and 30% of lands by 2030. But when you read into the plan about what it does, is it accurately saying that we're not already conserving 30% of waters and 30% of lands? I did a little digging into that and we actually already close off like 40.6% of federally held lands to multiple uses. So they're putting out misleading information saying it's only 12%, but it's actually 40% that threshold has already exceeded. Um, so that's something to look out for. That's going to be a, an issue uh, that you'll see arise in conservation, I think, in the environmental news. It's had a little traction, but um, it'll certainly take a bit more precedence in the coming months, I think. And then this doesn't really concern Michigan so much, but out west, we are starting to see the expanding of national monuments. And sometimes when those expansions happen, hunters and anglers lose access to public spaces. It's very counterintuitive why that would happen, but they have a, a method to their madness with that respect, but something maybe more um, in proximity to Michigan is sometimes when wilderness areas are designated that can close off access with roadless rules, things of that sort. So those could be weaponized, both of those designations to keep people off of public lands. And that's not very conducive to true conservation efforts. Next slide. How can conservatives win on conservation slash environmentalism? I'll lay those out for you guys. I think we have to tie into the fact that energy independence is a national security issue, especially in light of what is happening in Ukraine, because it exposes us to being very vulnerable and actually much of the world to being vulnerable. I have family in Eastern Europe. My family is from Lithuania, which was the first Baltic Republic, first actually occupied Republic at 15 to break away from the Soviet Union, a great champion of freedom, great country. I hope more people learn about it. And Lithuania is still reliant on Russian oil and gas. And that astounds me. And much of Europe, unfortunately, has shifted to this clean energy agenda. And as a result of that, they've become very reliant on Russia. 
for that. So a lot of vulnerabilities have been exposed. So I think here stateside, going back to the, the heart of it, having those two kind of be tied to one another is essential in the grand scheme of things, because it's not just wildlife conservation, it's just all of this, because we, we believe, like I said, in balance use. We want to advocate for market-based solutions or very limited government solutions when it comes to addressing environmental problems. I think also something we have to do that some conservatives have spoken to in DC have like chided me for this, but I think you have to decouple the climate element from environmental issues more so, more broadly, because you lose people with the certain talking points. You're not really assertively conservative sometimes with it. I've told them like, oh, your argument is a little weak when you're saying we have to do this, but a conservative or Republican version of it, when people start to see that you can't really forcibly transition to a net zero policy, um, but you can still talk about climate. doesn't mean you don't have to talk about climate, but I think a decoupling does have to take place, especially in light of current events, higher rates, things of that sort. I think we can have an all of the above energy policy, but we can still lean heavily on fossil fuels, oil and gas, natural gas, coal even. I know coal is a dirty substance, according to more people, but in many states in Virginia, we still have it, and I think it's produced in a cleaner fashion. And nuclear, I think, is probably one of the more interesting energies that are starting to get uh, more public support, and it's truly clean, net zero, but there's a lot of hesitation for it because people see uh, different nuclear reaction events from Chernobyl in Ukraine. They also see Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, what happened there, and then uh, during World War II, obviously, with nuclear bombs, a little bit unrelated to nuclear energy. Um, but people are very skeptical of nuclear because of past historical events or, or uh, explosions that have happened. So I think that hesitation may slowly start to disappear because people are realizing that it actually is a really good alternative eventually, but we should all still be very content with what we already have. It's a lot cheaper um, when they start to, <laughs> to explore it more safely. And then I think you can also point out the hypocrisy of people who tell you you have to transition away from a certain fuel source or you have to give up eating meat or you have to adopt lentils. There was a crazy article in Bloomberg that said that you have to get rid of your meat consumption and then adopt lentils into your diet. And I'm like, you don't need to do either of those <laughs> uh, recommendations. But I think if we are able to hit back at like, well, if you transition and you don't have something to back it up with, it's going to be very expensive to the consumer. And people are not going to incline to those ideas because they're paying more. And people are very comfortable here in the United States. They don't want to have to pay more to have cheap, clean energy. So I think these are some solutions for conservatives to advance conservation. Next slide, please. I'm going to point out two books to you that I think will be really, really good to have as handbooks or even just for your general reading pleasure. I like to do a lot of water sports. I think a lot of you guys do too. We're in a very, very prime location for prime boating, fishing here in the Upper Peninsula. This gentleman is a very interesting environmentalist. His name is Wallace J. Nichols, and he wrote a book talking about the blue mind or how you're at peace and you're healthier and happier if you adopt this state of mind where you're by the water, whether you're surfing, fishing, boating, and doing similar activities on the water. And he was even very critical of his fellow environmentalists saying that if you scare people and use a lot of facts and make people feel guilty about contributing to environmental problems or not doing enough, he said essentially that uh, what the environmental movement is doing is scaring people, making them feel bad, and overloading them with data. So even to hear an established environmentalist say this was encouraging to me. So they even recognize, I think many of them, that perhaps the tactics they were using, the rhetoric they were using on a daily basis was not winning over people. So his book had talked about this towards the end of it, but it's a really good read. And if you're interested, I highly recommend it. Next one. How many of you have heard of Michael Schellenberger? Okay, a handful. He goes on TV and he's actually running for governor of California against Gavin Newsom. And he's a big time nuclear activist. He used to be a preservationist and he has kind of repented for pushing kind of climate alarmism and other philosophies that were alienating people. And he wrote this great book called Apocalypse Never. And he often blogs and writes about nuclear energy he has also talked about keeping oil and gas as part of our electricity grid and as part of our portfolio, excuse me, for uh, fueling sources. 
Um, but he's a great person to follow. Like he's a phenomenal Substack newsletter and he also is on TV frequently. You'll see him on Fox News and he'll go to any media outlet, but he's a very interesting guy and he's trying to combat some of the alarmism that is infiltrated into his profession and kind of clouded the judgment of a lot of serious climatologists and also uh, similar experts in that field. So he's a really interesting person. So I think looking to him as well, if you're looking for authority sources, also a good recommendation. Next slide, please. Um, something especially for you college students here in attendance. Um, some suggestions for you in terms of how you can define the narrative to your classmates, to your peers, to those online on social media. Um, for conservatives to be really successful, I definitely recommend not repeating leftist talking points. Like I said, with climate, sometimes conservatives are really hesitant to kind of make up their own opinion of that subject or to environmentalism writ large. So I say, don't espouse the typical talking points. And if I can be a resource for you about how to communicate conservation or environmentalism, I would love to be that resource for you. I'm very approachable, would love to help you with that. I think you can also be action oriented and living out the lifestyle more. And you don't have to be gung ho into hunting and fishing. You can plant trees, you can clean up a creek or a stream. There are many ways to be proactive. Uh, you can partake in activities or you can do basic cleanups. But um, you can be action oriented, not just talk, but also act. And then also um, join true conservation organizations. There are many different groups out there, lots of Michigan chapters available to join. I think there are great free market environmental organizations. If you want a kind of a guide or like organizations to follow, there are many. Um, a group I'm going to suggest is called the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, who I work very closely with. Um, we have a student fellowship. If you guys are interested in working on these issues more broadly, I can connect you to my colleagues. And there's also the Property and Environment Research Center and many, many others out there. But there are a lot of good center-right organizations that exist. Heritage Foundation also covers the energy and environment portfolio. And uh, lots of other groups are emerging as well. So we do have people on our side focusing on these issues. And I'd be happy to point you in their direction as well. And I think the most effective way to be effective as a conservationist is to tell your own story. I try to tell my story to people, whether it's a casual conversation or if I'm touring different campuses speaking, I share my story and people feel empathetic and they like it and they can kind of relate to it and be like, oh, this is interesting. I didn't know that perspective or I didn't know you could do that. And so telling your own story, whether you're a seasoned angler or hunter or someone new and you're really open-minded to it, I think that's the most effective way or you really care about saving a species, or you really want to protect a stream, or you really want to enhance voting access, whatever your cause is, I think telling your own story could be the most impactful way to do it. And I have an Aldo Leopold quote about how the private landowner can best conserve the public interest. And then I think I have one more slide in terms of opportunities, like I mentioned, for you younger folks, or for those of you in attendance who have uh, college-age students, um, the CPAC Dreesen Fellowship, a great way to have a paid internship. You'll work with some foremost uh, scholars with us, sometimes maybe even me, or you could bring me to your uh, different meetings or things of that sort. So I sometimes work with the interns as well. And then I also participate in the Young Voices Contributor Program, where we help mold and meld um, center-right conservative libertarian thought leaders to be printed in prominent magazines. And then eventually, if they excel in the program even further, we put them into radio and even TV sometimes. So if you're looking to make your next step as a media person, even being in college, this is a great program. I would love to be a connector for you there. And then I think I have a slide about all my social media links and I'm happy to now do Q and A because I think I talked too much on the subject, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you guys for hearing me out. Uh, so how are we doing Q and A? <laughs> Why does someone, I can, yeah. you guys take it to the audience. Any questions? Gabriella said to uh, be action oriented. Um, this past summer for the first time I visited Alaska and all my life I heard that the Alaskan pipeline was this dreadfully terrible thing. Well, we were uh, uh, going north from Valdez along the highway and we stopped to take in nature and you're way high up and you can check things out. And we got a highway, we got uh, a power line system, and we got the Alaskan pipeline. 
the imprint of the three of them are, is, is essentially identical. So how can it be that horrible when, you know, from, from a distance, they look all the same. So I would say get outside, action oriented, and ignore the nonsense and the lies that, that I feel I've been fed because they make it sound like it's going to be a wasteland and it, it, it's, it's like so incredibly boring to see it. <laughs> and, and, and the cost of not having it isn't outstanding. So don't believe the nonsense. Yeah, it's very true to see it for yourself. An example kind of similar to that is in, I alluded to Virginia's elk population. Virginia elk country is on the backdrop of our remnant kind of fledgling coal industry. And that area has endured a lot of different crazy activities, whether it's like floods or fires, things of that sort. And it's had economic downturns and upturns. And in the region now, because of just that kind of buoyancy, the elk are kind of seen as a stabilizing force, even against the backdrop of the coal industry and then also an active well drilling industry still there. So you have reclaimed coal fields now serving as elk habitat. And it doesn't look like that, but you go there and you see that and you're really amazed when you can take apart kind of what maybe preconceived notions of a different area and then see it for yourself, like you said, with the with Alaska. And I think a lot of people don't want to. They are just maybe in denial about seeing something. Maybe they don't want to be proven wrong, but you're absolutely right. So I wanted to throw that anecdote out there for that. So thank you for the comment. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, one thing you spoke about, there was an organization, Young Voices. Yes. I think the biggest problem we have is the lack of our the conservatives' ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. The left owns the media. They, they do. Right. You can't say they don't. They have for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we they know how to brand things. Mm -hmm. We don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we because I think we operate under the assumption that we, everyone thinks like we do. You know, that, that we want things to be accessible for everybody. And we kind of are more free thinking and we don't mm -hmm. want people to regulate us. Mm -hmm. So we just go in with that assumption. I think that's what happened to Trump when he got into Washington. He thought he could negotiate with both sides mm -hmm. of the aisle. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't about to happen. So I, I think that I have a brother who's in the media and he we've had this out conversation forever, but since social media came about, news gets out there instantaneously and it's never vetted. Mm -hmm. It's not like it was when Walter Cronkite was reporting on the Vietnam War and it took a week to get it through things, the, the truth came out of that. But now people accept anything, no matter where it comes from. And, and I just think we do a bad job of um, getting that out. In one case in point, I was thinking about the whole nuclear thing, and I'm a real, I really believe that nuclear energy is, is a good thing. Right on, yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyone here who knows, you, you know, an MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. Well, years ago, it used to be called nuclear resident imaging and medicine realized that it was a bad thing to call it that because people thought they were being exposed to it. So they changed it to magnetic resonance imaging. So why can't we change the name of nuclear? Or something? That's a good proposition. I mean, but it's just, yeah. so anyway. No, I think what you said about conservatives or libertarians or anyone on the center right um, kind of engaging in the media field. So for me, it's I've had the ability to penetrate traditional media. And there are some people who are on the other side in, in major publications who, if they hear like good conservative arguments, they'll print your stuff as long as you're, you know, civil things of that sort can make a good argument. So I've had the luxury of that. And I think most editors do like that. They want other opinion. I've heard many people tell me, where can I find good conservative opinions on this topic, that topic? Can you write? And I tell them no, because I have too much of a bandwidth. I can direct you to this person. There is a hunger, I think, for the conservative perspective, especially in this portfolio of issues. It's just, people are not connected to the right individuals. And if you guys need steering in that direction, maybe I could be a resource, um, whether you do the Young Voices program or not, or if professor, you guys wanna have more like writing or journalism things, maybe I can come back or do a virtual summit on that, um, kind of seminar on that. But there is a, a way for people to get out there. And I think conservatives are starting to catch up to the left. I noticed when I first got into social media, podcasting and other activities like a decade ago or so, uh, conservatives were just starting to play catch up. Now it seems like we're dominating a lot of outlets. I know it, it's been a little troubling with a lot of censorship and, and that's a problem in many regards. Uh, but conservatives have an opportunity with what's at our disposable disposal, excuse me, 
to articulate our viewpoints, especially on these issues. And I think because we're seeing gas prices go up, I think the cost of like even just taking your boat out to fuel your boat is going to be a logistical nightmare. I can't even fathom if I had a boat. I don't have a boat. It's very expensive. I can't unfortunately maintain such a purchase. But I, I can imagine like the way you want to talk about how these issues relate about energy saving, about cheap fuel sources, like related to boating. I know people here in Michigan love to boat. And you could say, well, this is a result of these preservationist far left environmental policies that the cost of your boat joyride is going to be a lot more, especially this summer. And I know it's it's an invaluable type of experience. So I think when you personalize like that, or if you write an op-ed or a letter to the editor about that saying like, I may have to rethink boating this summer because of the cost going up or why these policies will adversely affect my recreational activities. There's a way that you could do it. Um, and in Michigan too, there are plenty of outlets, I think, uh, locally, statewide to do it. And you can start there. And if something blows up, in terms of garnering attention, you never know, it could go national. I know uh, the campus was in the news um, not too long ago for some very reactionary student responses to some of the YAF events, but um, you can utilize even those kind of reactionary events to your advantage, which I know you guys probably did um, in light of those uh, incidences. But um, there are opportunities. We have everything at our disposal. And if you need to make the connection, I can be a guide in that respect as well from Washington um, at minimum. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I have a thought for the students regarding climate change and um, America's one nation under God. So if you go back to a biblical principle, what does the Bible say? The earth will burn in a fervent heat. <laughs> so when somebody wants to discuss that with me, I say, so do you have a problem with God stroking the stove? <laughs> and on that same note, as a conservative, and a steward of God's beautiful creation, I believe people have the good intent, like you said, to leave it a better place than we found it. So I think that's a nice biblical principle to take with you. Yeah, that is a good thing to apply. And I think um, you can even make the argument whether it's biblical or scientific. We have a lot of evidence we could use. I think, mm -hmm. if I may inject here, sure. I think that's kind of the problem with the conservative. We always want to say, or scientific, the Bible. I, I don't I don't think conservatives should have a problem with that. But I, I hear what you're saying to blend it, but I think that's the problem. You have to choose what's best for you. Right. And you can apply both. I, I think conservatives should do both. Whatever's is best to tailor to your message because if you're speaking to more secular audiences they may not receive that well I'm not saying it's a bad message i'm just saying they may be like well how can i blend the two or how can i communicate so it, it depends on your audience but you can like i said meld the two if you think that's most effective any more questions let's do it. yes and then okay, i'll get started. so i have a bit of a comment so i'm from central lower michigan and the area that I'm from, there are both oil fields and solar farms. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's interesting because you get to see this, you know, the green, new, better technology and the old technology. And the thing that I notice is that, because I live in a farm area, um, the oil fields are like, you know, a couple acres mm -hmm. around the wells and then the access roads. And then it's all, you know, corn and soybeans around them. But now they've put up these solar farms. So there's literally hundreds of acres of unfarmable land that you can't do anything with because it's in the shade and there's electric wires everywhere underneath it so even if they get rid of the solar panels it's going to take a huge amount of money and time to recoup that land and so i think that we we need to be mindful of the risks of new technology because like going back to nuclear in the 1950s people didn't really understand the risks and so there were some pretty serious incidents. And I think that we're on the path to do that with wind and solar in mm. particular. Now, I mean, why are you putting solar panels over farm fields? That's, and, and I think that the, like you said, the conservatives can use some of that because I mean, it's true. It's true. You know, what are you, how are you going to farm? Right. So that's, I don't know. It's just, it's a very interesting place to see like, you know, small, the small, operations of the oil companies and then these huge solar farms right right next beside each other right yeah i've noticed um 
I was in Florida driving to Tallahassee and I noticed a huge solar field and it stunned me. I was like, okay, it makes sense because Florida is a very sunny state. So I think on a case by case basis, you can have large scale projects depending upon if the base load can upkeep. So in very sunny states, as long as you're not interfering with land use and things of that sort, I think solar fields could work well, although they are known to be toxic when they're decommissioned and they exhaust a lot of land, like you mentioned. Um, and then wind turbines are also an interest in an interesting predicament where kind of the land use for them is questionable. It's a lot of tracts of land and acres of land. And when those blades are decommissioned, can they be recycled? There's a lot of debate over that. And then you have the issue of birds, endangered birds, birds of prey flying into it. Um, and, and many other things, people don't like it on the landscape. It's too noisy. Lots of other concerns with, uh, with wind turbines. But in states where there's a lot of wind, it works well. And I think a lot of people um, doing it privately and maybe not on a big scale basis where you see like your utility company putting up different like turbines or solar fields. I think individually, if you do that, I think that's better because you're choosing, you know what's best for your land if you're a landowner. Um, you're going to know how much land is exhausted when you install a wind turbine or put in a solar field, or if you put it on your house. I know lots of people like to put solar panels on their house, which I'm totally fine with because that really doesn't do anything to harm versus putting a solar field. But every state has different needs. And when we see the government say, well, every state has to adopt this, I'm looking at Virginia's electricity grid. We're primarily um, using natural gas, like 61%. Nuclear is our second biggest electricity generator at 29% and then think biomass and then some other alternatives are seven coal is at 4%. So it's really minuscule right now, even though they're pushing in that direction and every state has a similar portfolio. I don't know what Michigan's is off the top of my head, but if you look at the energy information agency, you could see how your state compares. What are the top uh, sources and generators of electricity? And you'll find that most states are still heavily reliant on oil and gas for the most part. And some are starting to adopt. I think Texas has um, is the biggest generator of wind in the country. And this, it's like one of the second largest, I think it's their second largest electricity generator. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know Texas is, was able to do that on their own. And, you know, it worked for them. There's a lot of debate over, people have said um, with uh, that Texas uh, winter storm, whether or not there were vulnerabilities with that. Uh, but every state is different. So if states adopt things differently, I think that's fine, even if I don't want to see personally like solar and wind everywhere. But if states feel that's better, go for it. I think that's fine. But we can't have the government telling us, well, you all have to put solar. You all have to put wind. You have to let localities and state decide and private individuals decide what is best. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you go around the room here, I think you're going to find people who have very strong opinions on each of these different technologies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, you know, if you go around the room and the majority of these people are conservative, what we should be doing is talking about market-driven solutions, mm -hmm. something that we can all agree on is what is, you know, that's a conservative principle. Rather than getting us all infighting about whether we build more nuclear plants or more wind farms or, you know, and, and I think that's the strategy that conservatives need to take if they want to be uh, relevant right. in the next five or ten minutes. Yes, sir. The other thing we need to do is <laughs> use the power of the purse. We spend our money with those that align with our values. You now, these companies start to see a big drop in their sales because conservatives aren't buying from them. They'll change their policy. Yeah, I wonder if that could be done with a utility company. What's the utility company here in Michigan? Okay. Do they have like a big monopoly? Do you guys have concerns with it? Do you think they have too much of a stake? So, okay, every state has like a monopoly utility company. If they actually, like you said, if they were competing, I don't know if there's a private company that could uh, necessarily. Uh, our companies are government mandated yeah, monopolies. For the most part, yeah. Uh, but if they had a private company competing with them, I think that could help them reduce costs and things of that sort. But no, most of them are unchallenged, unfortunately, and um, have a stake in that. But I think, yeah, with energy, if you support companies that are not, let's say, going woke or charging you too much, that could also send a message. I think a problem that we're starting to see with different companies is the adoption of how many of you have heard of ESGs? It's like the social corporate responsibility framework for energy companies, companies. 
Um, so they're trying to do that from the energy angle. And a lot of people are getting kind of um, upset by that, rightfully so. So maybe that's a way like opposing companies that embrace this fully um, could be a good way. Any Anyone else have questions? Yes, sir. This is interesting. We're part of a group around here that's fighting the giant windmills that are coming in here. Oh, are you? Yeah. So if there's a $100 million <laughs> project that's been trying to come in here with 600 foot. And uh, the interesting thing is on the board, it's a very much a mix of conservatives and liberals. Really? And the interesting thing is when we bring in people to speak, they're conservatives talking about the law, kinds of laws like you're talking about, having the ability to fight it. And then there's the bird people, and they're really true environmental people that kind of live it. Mm -hmm. Don't want to see birds chopped up. Mm -hmm. They really don't want to see mountains bulldozed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea of this green energy is great, but the more you look into it, the more you find the nasty minerals from China, like you said, that come mm -hmm. in. The bulldozing of mountains the destruction of the oceans as you and so there's there's this government <clears throat> ponzi scheme of environmental money that that mows around and goes in the pocket the guy that's trying to put it in says he's an environmentalist <laughs> but what he wants to bring to us is destruction when the, a different there's got to be there's been, I, i'm thinking hydrogen eventually there's going to be new technologies that are going to do this windmills are ancient technologies but I just thought it was interesting that when you actually get to the group that you actually are working with, you're working across the line yeah. to actually keep the land the way it is and the way it should be. Whether it's, I would say we are conservatives that are conserving, you know, not, we don't want to preserve just for that sense. Right. So. Yeah. Could you send me information on that? I would love to profile that. I think uh, the connection between untraditional allies. Um, I do that a lot with uh, freelancing. There's actually an interesting alliance between conservatives, liberals, leftists, progressives, conservatives. So there are issues even on these environmental fronts. And so after I answer q and I would love to, to get your input. That's really fascinating. Okay. Uh, yes, you. So the uh, gentleman before mentioned about how you can market this to people. And, and I know you're giving a couple examples about that. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of examples of real world application? Or, yeah, real world ways of making marketing. Marketing, okay. Uh, specifically for like, do you have a, a an issue you're concerned about here in Michigan that you'd like to see take off? Because I could kind of help you formulate something even off the cuff now. Um, like something or just general or, or what are you passionate about that you'd like to see marketed more effectively? Yeah. Oh yeah, Bristol Bay. So I differed from some conservatives in not supporting that. Um, usually I would support mining projects like that, but I do support Boundary Waters Twin Metal Mines. It's a very interesting thought process with that. But um, conservatives even supported not having the pebble mine there too. Um, but I'm trying to think of an issue in terms of, maybe gas is a little easier to, to formulate something. Um, in terms of a marketing campaign. I've seen people, this is not related to conservation so much, but people are registering people to vote at gas stations. A lot of Republicans are. And I think you could, you could contextualize. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there are different reports. I've seen people do it. It's happening in Nevada. You guys are a swing state. If I'm going to put my political hat on, I'm not telling you how to vote. I'm just telling you um, analysis of politics. But here in Michigan, you guys are a very important political state. And if you can contextualize rising costs to whoever the incumbents are, I know who your governor is, <laughs> but if you tie it to who's in charge and <laughs> if you tie it to, let's say those currently in power and are able to make the case with it and even tie it nationally, I think you could run away with getting people to vote the way that you want them to vote or to reconsider support for clean energy or that just this move away from gas powered cars. We had something in Virginia and I think is Michigan um, part of this California framework to move away from gas powered cars. Virginia just adopted this and I know other blue states or uh, purple states had adopted this, but 
Virginia passed a law, and part of that law was a stipulation that we'd move away from gas-powered cars eventually by 2030 or 2035. So if there's a similar law like that here in Michigan, and costs are going up and people can't afford electric vehicles, you could point to that law being in effect if it is in effect and say like, well, maybe we need to revoke this law or maybe we need to not move away from having gas powered cars because EVs, the infrastructure for them is not currently available. It's very expensive. Even the subsidies won't help you and subsidies are bad in general. Um, it's not really market solutions and, and the subsidies only benefit those who can already afford EVs. But I think if you tie in to see like what's already in law, if the Whitmer administration passed anything, and I have to go back and see if Michigan is part of this conglomerate of states, um, but maybe not, maybe yes, uh, to move away from gas powered cars. But if that policy is in effect or there are policies encouraging the phasing away of fossil fuels or moving away from gas powered cars, then you can tie it like that and people will be able to relate to it. And I think if you cite studies that show that any like increase in like $10 increments to your electricity bill um, and have, see how that kind of inversely relates to support for climate policy. So there's a, there are numerous studies that show that the more you pay for cleaner technology or cleaner energy, the less support there is for it when it affects your pocketbook. So just cite basic statistics. And then if you have a story to it saying like, well, I like my gas powered car. I don't want to get rid of it. I'm ensuring that I'm being resourceful with it. I'm not going to, you know, uh, keep my exhaust on. I'll turn it off when I need to. So if you relate even like your usage of a car too, I think, in addition to that, but but there are ways to go about it, personalize it, use facts and data, and then you can go to gas stations and see how people feel about paying at the pump. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Yes, and then I'll go back to you. Mm -hmm. I've just found myself in more conversations over the past two, three years where I'm talking to somebody and I say I'm a lifelong Republican. They say, well, I'm a lifelong Democrat, and there's no difference between us, huh. literally. Hmm. You know, I'm talking to somebody that I kind of would literally have grown up with, and it's almost like this political identity. It's like sitting here and trying to divide which way to go. It's like, hey, just talk to people. Right. And you'll find that the bulk of people are not crazy. It's true. So <laughs> <laughs> if you go, if you go out in our local community here, you know you're going to be 80 percent plus a very conservative this, this community. And regardless of what your political affiliation is, mm -hmm. the reality is just the conversation with most people. You find out you have more in common than you do different. And, you know, instead of trying, I hear you trying to say, "What you divide, create this local vote." It's like, no, we need to come together more as a society to handle it, but handle it on a local level. Mm -hmm. you know, the locals know what they need. They don't right. need, you know, the state government. We don't need somebody from Detroit, which is eight hour drive, <laughs> telling us how to live around here. Right. And when you can turn around and say, how's your neighbor? Right. And it's, a, it's that kind of community. And I just look at it. So when I hear the, you know, the ideas of dividing people, I think we need to kind of come together and the best solution will show up. I, I hope I wasn't trying to divide. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just throwing it out there. When I, when I look at the political, I, I watch it. I'm an, I'm an avid, I follow politics. Mm. But it's like, I just the more I follow it, the more I'm convinced that you have to work in your own backyard. Right. Work no. in your own backyard, spread the message locally, talk to your classmates at the university, talk to your professors. Don't be afraid to tell your professors if you disagree with them. Believe me, they're just humans. <laughs> That's true. No, I understood your point um, in terms of how I frame it. Uh, and I, I try to talk to people on the opposite side of the aisle, too. And even in conservation, even with people who disagree with me politically, I do find some common ground. I've noticed, like you said, you'll find more agreement with people than not. Some people will be unreasonable to deal with. That's just the nature of things, politics, especially people are just very set in their ways. They're not open to hearing different things. But even in like you had said about you have bird conservationists and free market environmental thinking folks coming together to oppose this big wind project. There are a lot of areas where that overlap does happen. Same with solar field opposition, um, lots of other, I, I've, I've seen little bits and pieces, but you don't really hear much about it because it's not convenient to the narrative because the narrative is everyone agrees, there's no dissension, but people from all political stripes, when they start to see the cost and the impact on the landscape, they realize they can't support it. 
And so it is very true that, that localism, I think, is what is lost. And anytime we go back and forth between political administrations, I notice this under democratic administrations that they don't emphasize localism that much. It's like everything is government dictates all and you guys have to follow those decree. But what we should be seeing and what I was starting to see a little bit with the Trump administration was that we were starting to see the localism approach, people working together to solve a problem, whether it was the grizzly bear or the gray wolf. And now we start to see where that localism is not there. We have federal judges, we have environmental groups suing, in different uh, district courts to prevent the management of different species, species that locals and biologists know how to manage well, or other different conservation issues where you have outside forces coming in to dictate what should be happening in the region. It's a complex subject, but it it, it is very common, unfortunately, with um, environmentalists using the practice of sue and settle to basically make it harder for local stakeholders to manage and, and dictate how things should happen in their backyard. So we do start to see a lot of that. And that makes me nervous and, and really is disquieting to me, even as like an American, that these people who don't have anything to do with an issue go into these different cities or towns or states and they try to dictate to people from afar about how they should live their lives. So I think, yeah, if you talk about localism and the importance of keeping things in Michigan, the Michigan way in terms of conservation, definitely that's that's a sellable talking point. Any more questions? How much time do we have for a few more questions, but any more? Any general comments? Couple, Just couple a quick one quick yeah. aside. Um, really recently, California has to collect their car owners not to charge their cars off as often because they don't have enough electric cars. That's right. In other words, <laughs> they don't have the infrastructure. It's putting the cart before the horse. And that's right. what this whole thing is about. Right. None of us in this room, we'd all like to see cleaner energy. We'd yeah. all like to see things done, but you want it to be done in a common sense. Right. Yeah, I think people, I, I think an electric vehicle is cool to look at. Would I pay $50,000 for it? No. At this point in time, there's no need to. I drive a Subaru Forester. It's a very economical car. I could put my fishing rods in it. There are lots of economical, big SUV type cars that don't really consume that much gas. And, and they're safe and they're fun and comfortable. And yeah, the, the push for everyone to have that makes no sense to me. Again, all of the above, everyone should be able to pick and choose what they want. And I think people being told they don't have choices in their vehicle choice, I think people will, Democrats and Republicans alike will not like being told what kind of car they should drive. Should they go to electric? Should they not go to electric? People want to be able to make the best decisions according to their budgets, their needs. I know in a lot of rural areas and working towns, my dad's in construction, so I can I can empathize and, and see this this argument and I like it and I don't disagree with it. But people who work in construction, even in suburban, urban outposts, they need to have big trucks that consume a lot of oil and gas or gasoline, excuse me, because a solar powered or EV powered truck can't do the same. It doesn't have the same mileage. It's not tested enough. Um, we don't know how long it will be able to endure drive things. That's sort. there are a lot of shortcomings with electric trucks, which sound great. I just don't know if it'd be short circuited, um, how often you have to charge it, things of that sort. So people still like conventional trucks because they're easier to use and people know what they are. And, and maybe down the road, electric trucks will be innovative enough and, and affordable enough. But yeah, I think, again, these preservationist environmentalists, especially those on the left, tend to say, well, you have one choice, you have to do this or else you're a bad person, you hate the environment. So I think fighting back and saying, no, let's afford people choices and let them make the best decisions and we can still have a clean environment, all the while not giving up our comforts and the luxuries that we have as Americans. I think that's what we're starting to see now. People are finally punching back, saying like, we don't need to sacrifice so much. We could still do everything to have a healthy environment and a good economy. Yes, ma'am. Well, something I've recently become <clears throat> very concerned about is the lack of education and awareness about so-called geoengineering. Um, Could you explain what that is? Yeah, spraying, the chemical spraying in the atmosphere by airplanes. Um, have you done any research into that at all? I have not, so I don't want to offer an uneducated response to well, that. I would encourage everyone to look into this. On Those are chemicals. This is water vapor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that would be nice. Um, there is that, um, like, Saturday all day, the chemtrails were really heavy in the atmosphere. And then Sunday, the very next day, the planes had no trails behind them. 
So um, it's, it's something you have to look into. Um, but it is, they've done some tests and they call them, there is aluminum, strontium, barium, and one other chemical that is detected behind, behind these planes. Um, it's not so bad here, but out west it's really bad. So I would just encourage everyone to look into this. Um, um, Geoengineering Watch does an excellent study on it. So it's going to be really detrimental to our planet. Anyone else have comments or questions? Anyone else? Are we done? Okay. Or, let's well, have you. Maybe, yeah. Uh, just real quick. Um, I'm a geologist, so uh, I don't specifically study oil and gas, but it bothers me when people talk about green energy or this idea that, you know, CO2 is this pollutant, right? I mean, we need that for life, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, but everything, all the manufacturing, everything that goes into making the solar panels and all the mining that has, goes along with that, there's a huge trail of other, you know, energy consumption just to build those things. And then bringing them usually from other countries, China owns or has, is endowed with most of the rare earth elements and mm -hmm. a lot of elements on the planet. So we're beholden to them to get a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess my point here is, I think for the students, you know, you guys have a really good opportunity to kind of passively inform some of your uh, your fellow students. For example, um, there's great videos by Happer, Dyson, Moore, who is one of the founders of Greenpeace. Some of you may have seen those. Oh, yeah. This is an hour and a half of sitting uh, watching YouTube videos. And they, they tell, I mean, and this is the real science, is that there is no climate apocalypse. Okay, this is also my opinion, but that's mm -hmm. not going to happen. In 10 years, the world is not going to be on fire. That's not going to happen. And if you look at the real science, the doubling of CO, it would, we would have to double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in order to raise the temperature by another half a degree. Mm -hmm. So most of the warming has probably already occurred. And this is good science. These are our... You know, Princeton scientists, uh, you know, very established. Right? This is and this is good science that is not out there. You, and and I've convinced some of my own students passively, just hey, just watch this video. Here's another idea. Here's another perspective. That's it. Because I think at the root of all of this, you, we can sit around and argue about, oh, we should put solar panels and we should put, you know, those aren't aren't in the future. That's not mm -hmm. going to solve the problem anyway, in my opinion. I mean, I've, I've studied this. Yeah. Geothermal energy, maybe, right? Some yeah. of those things. But you know, using oil and gas, you're just pumping all this cretaceous. You're, you're pumping what used to be on the planet in the atmosphere anyway. It's, it's a massive amount of it's biomass. Look at the NASA studies have shown 30 to 40 percent greening in the planet over the last decade. It's eating up the CO2. So wake up. I mean, that's where I think you as students need to make this little push into this university because that's real data those are real scientists so stop telling me that you know the science you can show them the science mm -hmm. yeah, I, I want I, I know you're gonna have but i want to throw a little there's a paper out there that was recently published <clears throat> about the solar flares coming down dropping the ions down and actually found that co2 doesn't have a place in the uh, in the in the global the theoretical global warming Jarek, Jarek, I'm going to get that paper to you. It was recently published, so I kind of I read it. Most of it went flying over my head. But uh, basically, somebody's done the science on it, peer reviewed, and it's proven that CO2 is not is not the actual cause. Of it. The other thing is, the Earth is really just a giant battery. The CO2 goes up the plants, <clears> the <throat> plants come back, they create mist, they cool the Earth back down. The seventy percent of it is moisture and clouds. Yeah. And well, and that's we, what they talk about in these videos, right? This. Well, more people like you who actually live, eat, and breathe the science should be talking about this instead of having these political activists who claim to know the science misinform people. So you should, if you have the ability to. No, no, I'm saying like, no, no, I know, I know, but I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying to a wider audience.
like people like you, because I can come and lecture to you guys, but I think listening to experts like you who study this extensively could be impactful. So think can, about it. Can you hold that? We yes. still have one hour with students. Oh, yeah. So let's uh, express appreciation. Thank you, guys. It was lovely to meet you. Thank you.